Good evening and welcome. I'm Tim Johnson Arsenault. I'm a 48-year broadcaster and member of the Vermont Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame. These days, I am employed by WTSA Radio in Brattleboro, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's discussion. This discussion is entitled Crisis in Local Journalism, Why Your Local Paper Matters. Tonight's event is presented by Vermont Independent Media, the publisher of The Commons, an award-winning free weekly based in Brattleboro, and Next Stage Arts in Putney. BCTV is our technical sponsor and will mute and unmute speakers and take care of all of our technical things that even a radio guy can't understand. Our discussion previews the screening of the award-winning documentary Storm Lake, presented by Middlebury New Filmmakers Festival at Next Stage Arts on Friday the 4th, beginning at 7 p.m. The film depicts the triumph and struggle of the Storm Lake Times and poses the following question. Does American democracy survive without the backbone of an independent local newspaper and local journalism? The newspaper industry has been in a steady decline triggered by a loss in readership and ad revenue, which have been migrating to other media, most notably digital. And then came the pandemic and the ensuing sluggish economy that impacted more advertisers, the core advertisers, and promotion of community events, causing major decline in ad revenue. Tonight, we'll talk about why we need local media, especially, and what the future holds. We've also invited some young journalists to the Zoom. We hope to answer any of their questions or thoughts tonight. Viewers are invited to post questions to the chat. And I believe we also have several reporters on the call. We'll try and answer as many questions as we can as time allows. We're good for the next hour and a half. With us tonight, Art Cullen, Pulitzer Prize winning editor of the Storm Lake Times, a family run weekly newspaper in small town, Iowa, and author of Storm Lake, a chronicle of change resilience, and hope from Heartland newspaper. Randolph Holhut is the news editor for the Commons. It's one of the first independent newspapers in the country, now celebrating its 16th year. Randy has worked as a newspaper reporter, editor, and photographer for the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, the Patriot Ledger in Quincy, Massachusetts, Eagle Times of Claremont, New Hampshire, and a brief cup of coffee as a copy editor at the Boston Herald, along with two tours of duty at the Reformer from 1989 to 1995 and 2004 to 2010. Tim Calibro is editor and publisher of the White River Valley Herald. They're located in the heart of Vermont and they've been publishing since 1874. Calibro, who also designs and lays out much of the paper each week, will be only the fifth publisher since the Herald was founded. No owner has held the paper for fewer than 20 years. Angelo Lynn is publisher and editor of the Addison Independent, founded in 1946 and always a family-owned paper. Angelo also publishes two magazines, Ski and Ride and Vermont Sports. His three daughters are in the business with him. They have been for the past decade, making them fifth generation. His wife, Lisa Goslin, manages and edits the two magazines. He's a past president of the New England Newspaper and Press Association. Lisa Loomis is co-owner and editor of the Valley Reporter, president of the Vermont Press Association, the founder and president of Mad River Valley Television, as well as co-editor of the Valley Reporter that serves at the Mad River Valley and Sugarbush and Mad River Glen Ski communities since 1971. Melanie Winters is the news editor of the Brattleboro Reformer. Melanie has been a journalist for over 30 years. She's been with the Reformer for more than 10 years, first as night editor 
and currently is managing news editor. The 145-year-old Brattleboro reformer, the 180-year-old Bennington Banner, and the 160-year-old Manchester Journal are now owned by Vermont News and Media Group, having been purchased from the New England Newspapers, Inc. in 2021. And finally, Penelope Muse Abernathy, author of four reports and two books on the state of local news and newspapers. She currently is a visiting professor at Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism. Penny will be listening in and join us at the end for a summary and overview and may post some questions in the chat. We'll now take a couple of minutes and screen the short trailer for Storm Lake. It's a dramatic comeback tale that points up many issues affecting newspapers today, and it's the reason for our discussion tonight. In a small Northwest Iowa town, the Storm Lake Times weaves the fabric of the community in large ways and small. Yeah, right? <laughs> We're on deadline, we're ready to put it on the page. I get real uptight about deadlines. Readers decide our future, not any branch of government. We have happy stories about all types of people. You're a singing star. <laughs> Most people in Storm Lake care about community. Hey guys. But how long does a community support journalism? Because now people want to get their news for free and people are saying, oh well, that's not worth a dollar. And that's not how you sustain a democracy. <laughs> We've always operated at the break-even point. Seven dollars. Mom and pop stores that were the basis of our advertising are gone. How else do you make a small community survive? All the meat packing plants are infected with COVID. No one's even talking about testing at this point. How sickening it is forcing immigrant workers into a deadly workplace. And to me, there are blatant forms of racism and there are subtler forms of racism, but it's racism all the same. We were the first ones to say a number of Tyson employees tested positive. And then there was this dramatic spike and it was unbelievable. We're continuing to report on the numbers as best we can. Now, Storm Lake is the hottest spot in the country. It's been a pretty stressful time, and we're losing money, and there ain't a thing you can do about it. Our ads fell off a cliff. It doesn't make a lot of sense to go borrow money when we could just walk away from it now. You can change the world through journalism. The reporter is the cornerstone in a functioning democracy. And without strong local journalism, the fabric of the place becomes frayed. The prospect of the newspaper not being around terrifies me. So if we do the right things here, we'll be all right. So let's get that story. A sobering story indeed. And many of us who our practitioners of local journalism live it in our own way. We'll start with you, Art, your story, and just how are things doing at the Storm Lake Times these days? And any takeaways from what you've been through? Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of takeaways <laughs> about what we've been through. Uh, uh, we're doing okay right now. Uh, uh, my brother started the paper in 1990 uh, in our hometown uh, uh, in competition with an incumbent chain-owned newspaper. And, uh, you know, both newspapers were suffering quite a bit heading into the pandemic. And we were fortunate in that we won a Pulitzer Prize in 2017 uh, for editorial writing on surface water pollution in Iowa. And... Uh, uh, which caught the attention of these documentary producers, one of whom is grew up on a hog farm in rural Iowa. And uh, uh, it, he read about us in the New York Times that this little paper in the middle of nowhere in Northern Iowa won a Pulitzer. <laughs> so he uh, called us up and said, hey, you know, uh, can I nose into your business? And we said, well, you, you know, we nose into people's business all the time. So sure. 
And, you know, so it, it kind of, you know, tells a story of civic engagement uh, about how journalism is kind of the, you know, the foundation really of civic engagement by informing the public. And then, and then it gets into, you know, the, the economics of journalism, how it's changed first with, the, you know, Craigslist, uh, robbing our classified advertising and, uh, and then going into, you know, Facebook and, uh, and all the other social media that have robbed reader eyeballs and advertising revenue and then the pandemic. And so, uh, Fortunately for us, we started something called the Western Iowa Journalism Foundation to raise money uh, to support uh, these independent family-owned newspapers in a five-county area. And because of the documentary, we were able to raise, I think it's been about $500,000 so far and uh, to support these newspapers. So we're in solid shape right now, uh, you know, but you can only go around with a tin cup for so long. And so we've got to use this time to really build a new digital product that really, uh, you know, can re-engage with readers. And uh, so that's our challenge going forward. Thanks, Art. Randy, you are working for one of the newest newspapers in this group, one of the first nonprofit independent weeklies in the nation. Tell us more about the commons, its story, how it all got started, and how COVID has affected things for you. Well, I wasn't present at the creation. I was at the other newspaper, at the Reformer, at the time uh, the genesis of the commons began. But it, it began out of a reaction to uh, people not very happy with out-of-town ownership of, the, of a, their newspaper and the perception that the paper was just wasn't theirs anymore. And it took two hours of kitchen table meetings, uh, two years of kitchen table meetings to turn into what became a monthly newspaper. And then when I came on in, in 2010, a weekly newspaper. And it was operated under an, a, a model that really was very new and very untested of, of, of being a nonprofit newspaper where we have no owner. We're owned by the community. And we operate on the public public media model, which is we'll give you the product for free, but if you like it, please kick us a little money. And it's surprising how much response we've gotten over the years. At first, the people said, well, why are you asking for money? Why don't you just, why don't you just charge for the paper? And it's uh, the issue, the, the principle we've had right along is that news is not a commodity, it's a public service. And there shouldn't be a toll booth in front of, in front of uh, information that your ability to, to pay for information shouldn't dictate your access to it. So, you know, the people who can pay for it do, the people who can't pay for it, we don't begrudge them a bit for reading it. We have a current circulation now of about 7,800 copies. It's down a little bit since, since uh, COVID started. We were about, a little above 10,000 then. We've lost some of our, our, our retail stops because they've closed or, or changed policies because of, of COVID. But, you know, we went through the same thing Art went through of watching our, our advertising of about 30 to 40% of it disappear. But at the same time, the 60% that stayed, stayed with us. And they didn't, and the donors who supported us gave more money. And thank goodness for the programs like uh, PPP and, and, uh, and the state of Vermont's uh, grants for that, because that gave us the cushion we needed to stay in business. Uh, we've survived the pandemic, but we're not what we were a few years ago. We are putting out a paper the best we can with very limited resources. And we're looking forward to the day that COVID's over and we can produce a stronger newspaper. And uh, in a town like Brattleboro, we're about 12,000 people. And a very opinionated, very engaged, very uh, insistent upon a print newspaper, which is why my colleague at, colleague at Reformer, which you'll hear more about later, Melanie will attest, uh, they really want the printed paper. And yeah, we're going to have to make a, a bigger push into digital as time goes on. But there are so many people that if we turned around tomorrow and said, no, we can't print a paper anymore. We're going all digital. 
there would be such an out, outrage and we would lose most of our advertising. Thank you, Randy. Lisa, as president of the Vermont Press Association, how do you see Vermont's story as compared with Storm Lake? I mean, Vermont is the size, the entire state of one moderate sized city. So therefore, what are some of the things that you see from a movie that would be of use here in Vermont? I see a lot of similarities. First of all, I see a lot of similarities between what was happening in Iowa and what's been happening here in Vermont with the, um, the same thing, bleeding away of advertisers, readers want their news online. Yet the other similarity I see with Storm Lake and what Art and his crew did in Iowa is we're telling the stories at, at the Valley Reporter and at the rest of the community newspapers in Vermont, we're telling the stories of the people in our community, what they're doing that's good. We're celebrating what they're doing that's good. We're keeping a very close eye on elected and appointed officials. We're shining the light of public scrutiny into the dark places where it needs to be shown in terms of those same public officials. We're watching our school boards like a hawk. You know, if we don't watch our school boards like a hawk, who's going to? Who's, who's gonna watch? healthcare prices go up, right? We're reflecting the needs of our community back to our local officials, to our state officials, and ultimately to our national officials. And we're advocating for our community. I spent a painful string of emails last week in conversations with the PR people at the Agency of Health and Human Services in Vermont, following up on somebody who told me there were masks, KN95s made available throughout the state at various specific drop points. And when I got to asking about where they are in my community, I was told, well, we don't want to publicize those because people will go scoop up the masks, which left me temporarily dumbfounded because I'm seldom at a loss for words. But if I can't publicize where my community members who can't afford to buy KN95 masks, where they can get them, that's sort of... <laughs> I, I did prevail. I was able to get some masks for our community, but that's, that's, a, that's one role of community journalism. Sometimes we call it micro journalism, you know, hyper local. Nobody else really writes about the new dog ordinance, but yet it, it's really important. You know, you can get a 50 or a $500 fine. So we celebrate micro local journalism. And I think that plus the kind of innovation that we hear our colleagues talking about is really how we do survive at the peak of the pandemic with half our staff suddenly and exactly with one day to plan, no, no days to plan, going home to work from home. We started making our paper half in the office, half at home. And we started a twice weekly newsletter because people needed information faster than we get it out to them in our weekly print issue. And we totally upped our social media game and started thinking of ourselves almost as a three-dimensional platform as opposed to a once a week print platform. And we have to think that way three-dimensionally in order to survive. Thank you, Lisa. Let's talk with Angelo next. And let's talk about why people should care about local media, why it's important and how in your view has your paper adapted to the rise of the digital age? Uh, well, let's first talk about uh, why we should care about local media, and let's define local media, uh, Tim. Uh, and, and let's do that by looking at a couple of numbers. Uh, the last time, if you do a quick Google, um, we have 1,279 daily papers out there across the country. 1970, there were 1748. That's a decline of about 500 or 35%. We've all heard that kind of story. Um, but let's look at local papers. There are 7,000 non-daily newspapers, 7,000, that reach 150 million readers. I think Penny Abernathy can talk about some of these things, the, the numbers later in this uh, meeting. But when you talk about why should we care about local media, we're serving more than half the country with local media. That's, that's the first reason we should care. And the, the second reason is when you don't have community newspapers, you're not, you're, you're, hope, you're, you're losing the glue that connects them. And it's, it's what Art said in the story, it's the big things and the small things. And small things in community, the people stories, the, 
like the dog catcher ordinance, the, you know, those sorts of things that really get the people, the community, the people in your community to know their, their neighbors and what's going on downtown so they can talk to each other in the grocery store and in the bar or wherever it is. Those are the things that, that make community and, and hold it together. And when you think about that, when you think about not having those papers and not being informed about what's going on, what do you talk about and how you operate your community government? school boards, town boards, uh, and the rest of it. That's that's why we all should care. Uh, it is, and, and I think of this sometimes not as much as a watchdog. I, certainly that's one of the roles that we have as a watchdog, but it's also the glue uh, holding communities together and building community. And that's what makes small towns special. Um, so I, I, would, I would like to suggest that we, uh, in terms of the, digital scene, we all should be doing, um, you know, our websites, we should be doing social media. Uh, and, and we all are more or less and certainly the pandemic forced a lot of us to jump into that in a big way. As Lisa said, you know, we have a little bigger staff than the Waitsfield paper Valley reporter. So we we went to four newspapers or newsletters a week. And I was just checking one thing I wanted to share is when, when we talk about loss of readership out there, for the independent, our print readership is down about two or three or 400 pre, you know, compared to pre-pandemic. So we're 65 instead of 70, 72, something like that, maybe at 700. Uh, but mainly that's because a lot of the stores that we used to drop them off, you know, shut down. The retail stores don't have those papers uh, delivered in the same spot as they used to. And you're not you don't have the traffic in those retail spots that you used to. But what we do have is a tripling of digital readers. Uh, just, you know, we we have four newsletters that that are seeing 17,000 clicks. We have a video that we did on a train reach 17,800 people last week. You know, that's, so when you look at our print readership, you add that to a weekly, uh, you know, Facebook, that was on Facebook. Websites were getting 5,000 unique views on a single story and a single, you know, just on a, on a week. Um, and, and the open rates are amazing. We get 57% open rate uh, on most of our newsletters. So when I think about, when I look at the numbers, this is what's really encouraging to me. And I want to, you know, have a conversation maybe about this, about readership, because I think some of that storyline isn't as bad as it is. Like, you know, we should be reaching more people. And I think in a large way, we probably are. Um, so I'll stop there. We'll pick it up later. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Now we'll go to Tim. As editor and publisher of the oldest newspaper in this group, what do you see are your most important challenges? And maybe uh, you might be one of the younger uh, editors of this group. Tim? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, that's a kind of interesting question. And I think that I might have given you a different answer before the pandemic started. And since it's, you know, we're two years into it now, just about. Um, I would have said before that it was, it was a revenue challenge. It was, you know, how, how do we find some way that doesn't necessarily depend on um, display advertising in a printed newspaper? Um, because it doesn't take a genius to see that more and more life is turning uh, digital. Um, now, I think I'd probably say that our biggest problem is uh, people and communication. Um, I think we've probably all had this, uh, this feeling when we go to the, you know, different public meetings, public forums, and we, uh, we hear someone inevitably ask a question, you know, wouldn't it be great if the town had a website that would kind of tell us maybe once a week what's going on in the community that we live in. And I'm always standing in the back thinking, well, you know, there is exactly something like that. Where have we, you know, where have we failed in letting that person know that, that, uh, that we're out there. Um, and I think part of the, the big, um, one of the things that's most important to me is, uh, news literacy, uh, starting with, uh, with, uh, people at young ages. Um, I, got involved at the Herald because I was an intern in there when I was in high school and never escaped that orbit. Um, so we try to keep 
um, very close tabs on our high schools and welcome as many students as we can possibly accept to actually get involved with uh, helping us cover their schools, which has been remarkably successful. Thank you very much, Tim. Now we'll turn to Melanie. The reformer has been purchased recently along with the Bennington Banner and Manchester Journal. Our papers have been around for years. So how is the group as a whole and the reformer specifically surviving and maybe even thriving under the uh, new ownership? Okay, well, we were thrilled to return ownership back to the local area. Our owner uh, lives in Guilford and has several businesses in Brattleboro. So we have severed ties with corporate ownerships and head fund managers, which really have been detrimental to the um, newspaper industry. Uh, for the first few months after our owner bought us, which was about nine months ago now, we kind of spent a lot of time kind of severing ties with, with our former uh, employer, um, the, the Berkshire Eagle was our flagship paper. Um, since then, I mean, we've really gone, gone gangbusters trying to do uh, improve digital. We know that that's where the future is. Um, but as Randy said uh, earlier, given where we are, the Vermont demographics and the fact that some areas have spotty internet connection, we really have to maintain a, a, a print presence. Um, we have very, we have a lot of devoted readers who love the print. They, they love the feel, the textile, the just having it there and they're tired of digital. So we kind of, I mean, we, we, we can't abandon print. We kind of have to ease out of it. Uh, eventually these folks, you know, I'm sorry to say, they're going to get older and, and they're going to pass on and we're going to have newer readers who are going to be more digital. So we're putting emphasis on digital newsletters, uh, more video, um, uh, photo galleries, things like that. Um, and just uh, from the October to December period this past year, year over year comparisons, we've seen a, like a 32% increase in users on our digital site a 32% increase in sessions, a 39% increase in page views. Um, so the future is there. Um, you know, when our new owner took over, we, um, again, severing ties with the old company and also trying to beef up our newsroom a little bit and, and kind of streamline processes so that we could do more with less. That, that's a lot of what we have to do is try to figure out how to do more with less. We're, 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 razor thin right now in, in terms of staffing. Um, but I think we are still putting out a quality newspaper. People have, have been noticing the improvements um, over the past year. And so we're, we're encouraged about the future. The, the future is digital, but we have not abandoned print. I want to touch on something that Tim had said and maybe get him to follow up. And certainly anything that uh, we have to say if any of our panel would like to or chime in, please uh, let us know by hitting the raise your hand button. Tim, you touched on the concept of media literacy. What is it? What should people be looking for in this age where everybody and their brother and sister think they're a journalist? What is good information? And what is something that doesn't even deserve being put in the trash heap? All very good questions. And I don't know that I have a 100% uh, solid answer. You know, it's one of those, I know it when I see it type of things. Um, I, I do, I, I wonder this a lot, you know, what is, you know, what separates, you know, a reputable newspaper from any random uh, website out there somewhere. And, you know, I think that we all have this passion for telling the truth. And I think that's the thing that matters most to, to all of us and helping, helping students understand that goal um, and how it relates to them personally is the, the, always the big goal of uh, media literacy for me. Um, when the year, the year I bought the Herald from, uh, from MD Drysdale Dickey, who was my, uh, my predecessor and a mentor um, coming up through, uh, you know, from when I was 18, um, he joined us for a kind of a roundtable discussion with a new batch of interns that were coming in from the different high schools. And he posed the question to everyone, you know, why, why does a community newspaper matter? 
and had everyone give their own answer. And then he boiled it down to, to um, why he thought they matter. And it was just so succinct and perfect. He said simply, you know, bad things happen in our community and, and we deserve to know about those things so that the community can respond to them. And good things happen in our community and we deserve to know about those so that we can celebrate those too. And so to me, that's the essence of, of news literacy is communicating to the students how those exact things um, affect them and how they're part of the, the community that we're talking about, not just something separate. Thank you. I wanna further expound on that same question. Maybe I can bring Angelo into the conversation. I just, from a community perspective, I had felt that there was a certain amount of mistrust uh, during the 2020 election. Uh, my day job as a town clerk, I felt it. And people asking about why are we getting ballots sent to the mail? I didn't want these. I'm going to throw them away. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, what do we do now? They threw away the ballots we were going to use. So how do news sources gain trust of the community and make sure that they're getting the best information they can get their hands on? Yeah, that, that's a good question, Tim. I think it also speaks to the strength of community newspapers. Uh, you, you know, why, and, and this is, you know, from a democratic point of view, you know, if you look at the big picture in democracy and what role community newspapers play in, in this digital environment where we don't know what's true and what isn't, um, people believe community newspapers because they know who you are. You know, they know Angelo Lynn writes the editorials. They know Art Cohen writes the editorials. They know John Flowers reports and has been reporting those stories, by the way, for 35 years. Uh, when you have that sort of thing, when people know who's writing the, the story and, and when they see you and when they have access to you, um, this is, you know, this is how you gain trust. And you gain trust because You've been telling these various stories, like Tim just said, the, the bad things that you root out and you expose so we can respond to them, and also the good things that you can celebrate. When you do that year after year after year, and your team's been doing it, uh, that's how you get that community trust. So when you put, put something out there and you say, this is the way the election's going to go, we're going to mail these ballots for these reasons, makes perfect sense, editorialize about it, explain it. You know, most of the community around here, they said, makes sense. We'll do that. And it's not that they trust us. It's just that you're putting out that, uh, that message that they just believe. And, and that's, I think it's years of community uh, working together and having them trust story after story. By the way, some of that trust, and this is about the little things, some of it comes from reporting the high school basketball game right when you're down there and you get the kids' names right and you get their scores right and you get all that stuff right, you know, they, they believe the paper. Why not? <laughs> you know, and, and all those little things build up to add trust in a community. And that, that's what digital doesn't do as much. Um, and I will point out one thing about digital that, that kind of drives me crazy. Uh, and, and that is, um, so much of digital, particularly in Facebook and the social media world, is driven by algorithms, which, which kind of, you know, they're the sizzling things and the stories that make you react in, a ne in negative ways, I'll say. And, and that misses all these smaller things because small things don't make good clickbait. You know, what makes good clickbait are, you know, fiery headlines. Uh, and, but that doesn't make good community necessarily. So just a point. Thank you. We're going to go to Lisa, who wants to add to this question. Lisa? Am I unmuted? You are. Okay. I do want to, I want to concur with what Angela said and, and add a couple of points to it. We gain the trust of our community by, as he says, accurately reporting the names of the basketball players. But also, when our community members call us and um, complain about something we've written, we listen. When they call us, we call them back. When we make a mistake, we own it immediately. We are human and we do make mistakes. And 
over the course of many years, we have forged relationships with the people in our community, with the various groups in our community. And all of my coworkers and I live in the community. We're a locally owned business working to survive. And we, we feel like sometimes people forget that. It's easy, to, it's easy to bash the newspaper, right? It's always easy to bash the newspaper. Every per single person who calls the Valley Reporter, the Valley Distorter, thinks they're the first person on the planet to have done it. And they laugh and they cackle. It's, it, but it really is about building relationships. It's about being out and among your community, much like we saw with Art and his family. Not a one of them's not out in the community. Thank you. I'm going to uh, go further on some of these particular points. Um, Randy, I, I, I'll go to you next. Uh, we in my hometown, the town of Vernon, try to let people know what's going on in sort of a, a meeting calendar via social media. Uh, what does that do to the, the matrix of what you try to cover within a multi-town area? Well, we try, we use, we piggyback a lot on social media to in a certain extent because uh, it's, the double-edged sword of social media is that, yeah, it, there, it, can, it can spread misinformation like wildfire, but it can also yield a lot of good story tips and a lot of good information in, in, in cases when we can't get to things, but they can let us know that something's happening. Uh, during Tropical Storm, Irene was a good example of that, with, where we kind of crowdsourced the coverage of the storm from the, uh, our readers who were out in various parts who still had electricity and, and the internet, letting us know what was happening in, in their town. And uh, that's part of the community connection of, of, of that, that Lisa and Angela were talking about, that, of us being there and they knowing where to find us and, and trusting uh, what we do. Now, for the town of Vernon, I know they put out a monthly a newsletter, and that's always appreciated. And, uh, and Tim, among uh, town clerks that we cover, is very good about letting us know when meetings are. Not everyone does it. And uh, we kind of, it's a two-way street in terms of, Town officials helping us with, with letting us, giving us heads up on when meetings are, and we know when to when to do that. And uh, we try to get to it. And uh, BCTV is we've had a partnership with them for years of of using their uh, gavel to gavel coverage as a starting point for a lot of our news reporting. That you know they they're there providing the witnessing of, of a meeting, but they don't provide the context. We can take what they've done and then go make a few phone calls, talk to a few people and build a story from off of that. Thank you. Going to uh, go to Melanie. In trying to uh, run a company, especially a, a uh, company that has just changed hands, how tough is it to figure out what kind of connections you should make on, um, you know, paying people, trying to find the money from somewhere. Uh, it seems like changing hands right before or during a pandemic is uh, something fraught with problems. <laughs> it was challenging. Um, it was the simple things really of trying to reorganize healthcare for the employees and, and new vendors and, and trying to figure out newspaper delivery. Um, we ended up switching from um, paper carriers to mail um, just to, to, to save some money because we were bleeding money through the carriers in a rural area. We just could not sustain that. Um, just trying to, to bring more things in house um, instead of relying on the, the corporate structure, uh, just trying to like streamline and, and, and tighten up um, our belts a little bit and, and do more with less. Um, it, it's, it's been difficult, it, but um, like I said, it's, it's been great having everything come back here locally instead of having to answer to some nameless face. And we actually see our owner in our newsroom 
once in a while, you know, when he's not off traveling to Dubai or something like that, you know, he, his presence is known and, and he tries to get out into the community. He's got several other businesses, so he's got those connections too. It, it, it's been great, actually. I mean, we're not out of the woods. It has been difficult trying to navigate through a pandemic. And we thought just when, when Paul took over last spring, things were starting to open up again. You know, we, we had summer concert venues opening up and things were really starting. And then, at the end of summer, fall, things shut right down again and our advertising fell off the cliff again. So, I mean, really a lot is going to depend on how we come out of this pandemic. It's, it's a little too early to tell right now because we're hoping things open up again this spring. We'll just have to wait. Thank you and, and good luck. Angelo, you have your hand up. Unmute. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, I want to address one thing, and that is this: um, the notion that newspapers have to do more with less. Um, and and imagine a different world. Uh, I think art's there, and we can bring art into this conversation um, about having enough and being able to do what we used to be able to do when it was fun and you had a big news team and, and you were out there. Now, we, we've been able to maintain doing that for the most part um, for various reasons, mainly because I've owned it for 40 years. <laughs> but And we saved a little money in the good days. But, you know, this the idea about struggling always as, a, as an institution that is so fundamental to our democracy isn't what we should be striving for. You know, we, we shouldn't be striving for doing more with less. We should be striving for a world where we have adequate resources to the, do the job that we need to do, that we've historically done for the last 200 years. Um, so that's just one thing. I think we can have a discussion about how to do that. Um, but, um, you know, that's hopefully Art will chip in and, and, and we'll have that. There was a, a chat. Somebody asked a question, C, CJ that news literacy is also important for being uh, responsible citizens of a democracy. Um, and I think, you know, you look at this whole issue and, and we have all talked about this, but civics isn't taught that much in school anymore. Um, and, and there are reasons for that uh, because there, you don't test for civics, you know, test for math and sciences and spelling and those sorts of things, you don't test, test for civics. But media lit literacy is so very important and it's so misunderstood by a, a wide portion of the population right now. Uh, so it's critical that we address that. Uh, we do it in our schools. Uh, perhaps we should be doing it in weekly ways or daily ways in our newspapers as well. Thank you. And some of our people who are not on the panel, if they could please uh, post their questions in chat. Art, would you like to add to this one? Well, I, I just heartily endorse everything that Angelo said. Uh, uh, we still have a tremendous revenue problem, and I believe that a lot of this advertising revenue simply isn't going to come back. That's right. And uh, so we have to build around reader revenue. Right. And uh, in rural areas, that's difficult because the audience is pretty limited. You know, we have uh, 20,000 people living in our county. And, uh, and that's a more populous rural county in Iowa. So, uh, and there isn't a lot of money here. 90% uh, of our elementary school are children of color, uh, immigrants mainly. And so whose parents have limited English skills. And so it's very difficult trying to predicate a model on reader revenue when you, A, you have a limited audience and B, half of them can't read English. And uh, so you ha we have to supplant it with philanthropy for the time being, but I'm not confident at all that, uh, that philanthropy is going to carry us as a general interest newspaper uh, for much longer than a three to five year window. So I think we have about a three to five year window how to figure out our digital tricks because uh, you know I don't see anybody reading a newspaper in a cafe, in an airport, a hotel. Uh, they don't even read USA Today. And, uh, and so we, you know, we have to migrate to where the eyeballs are and they're all on cell phones. You know, my wife and I sit in this, you know, three feet apart and look at cell phones rather than speak to each other. 
And uh, although we work in the office together, so may we see enough of each other. <laughs> but uh, but I, you know, that's the real issue to us is is how to how to. Uh, and I, I disagree with Randy. I guess we predicate our model on paid readership, and uh, I believe that you know the cost of of an informed democracy in Buena Vista County is worth uh, 70 bucks a year. Uh, and, you know, I think that uh, people can afford $70 a year for a newspaper. And if they're, you know, if they're really that hard up, uh, you know, they do get five free views per month on our website. Uh, so th those are my rambling thoughts. Uh, I, I think that uh, we have, we don't have much time. We're we're stable right now, thanks to philanthropy. Um, got an interesting little story if you have the time. Um, one thing that happened is because of this documentary, uh, I was touring the Midwest, Detroit, Chicago, Minneapolis. We were on a swing. I get to my hotel room in Detroit at midnight, and I'm checking my emails, and I got an email from a guy in California who is a made it big in computers and he said I heard you uh, on an interview on Fresh Air on NPR this morning and I just want you to know that uh, I don't want your paper to close uh, and I want to do anything I can to help you make that to, and he said I want to drop 60 grand on you and he did the next day and uh, you know, there is a God and he comes in the form of a Chinese electrical engineer who immigrated to the United States. Uh, and one more plug for immigrants, by the way. So, uh, you know, the American spirit's alive and well in that guy. And he did come through for us. And uh, uh, but again, we were lucky. Uh, and I, I don't know how long he wants to continue to cough up money either. So uh, we've got to figure out how we can live in this marketplace. And there are models out there, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, the Boston Globe, um, the Seattle Times uh, are all doing tremendous journalism and it's paying off in increased readership. Uh, but our audiences aren't as big. Lisa, you had your hand up as well. If, uh, you'd like to unmute? I think I did. Okay. Um, I just want to pile on to Angelo's talk. You know, yes, we should not have to scramble for revenue, but we currently do. And we have to make enough money to keep the doors open. And we also have to be concurrently working towards this transition to full digital. At some point, that is where we're most likely where we're all going. But yet there's something beautifully permanent about a newspaper that records the history of your town and that your library collects from A to Z, from year, year one to year two. I was traveling in an airport pre-pandemic and stopped and picked up a daily copy of the New York Times. And I read the New York Times on my phone obsessively every morning, of course, but picking up a paper copy and being able to turn the pages and flip through it and let someone else curate my news for me, as opposed to reading all my own confirmation bias on my phone every morning, was such a treat. It was so nice to have somebody else select my news stories for me. And that's part of what we've all lost when we lose the ability to pick up a paper and let somebody, some trusted news source, provide us with a bunch of news. Does the government have a role in helping out the small journalism practitioner? Uh, I'll make this a jump ball. Maybe uh, Art could chime in on this and we'll see where it goes. Yeah, uh, the government can make an immediate difference by firing the postmaster general and uh, preventing a 9.9% uh, postage rate increase on the newspaper, uh, second class postage. And, uh, you know, Ben Franklin came up with this idea that we're supposed to have basically free delivery uh, and they keep raising the rates on us 10% a year. And uh, it's a huge major cost. Also, the year going into the pandemic, here's another thing the government could do. Uh, the going into the pandemic, uh, uh, our health insurance premiums went up $44,000. And that's, you know, for about a half dozen people on the plan. 
And uh, so we went, we started the year $44,000 in the hole because of Wellmark, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Uh, we need single payer health insurance because there is no competitive healthcare marketplace in Iowa. And I doubt there is in Vermont. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there about, you know, local ta uh, tax, property taxes to help support journal. I don't believe in any of that stuff. But if, you, if they just start with postal rates and single payer health care, it would be a huge relief to us. Let's then uh, go to uh, Randy and also Angela, who wanted to respond. Randy, you first. Well, I would second. Uh, I would second uh, Art's uh, thing about the post office because that's been a, a, a constant headache with us for both the rates and delivery. But I do believe in, as I said in my opening remarks, that journalism is a public service that's as important to uh, to daily life as as public health or uh, public safety or education, and it's worth it's worth supporting. And I know some in in our industry get really queasy about the idea of having uh, subsidize subsidies for for uh, for the journalism and the media. But other countries do support public media and support it in a more robust uh, manner than anything that's done in this country. And I believe there's there's a place for it, and certainly. Uh, with the PPP program during the, the last year, during the pandemic, it made a huge difference for a lot of small newspapers like the Commons. And I'm not sure whether, uh, Art, did you get any of that money? Yeah, we got $60,000 and it saved us. Uh, There's no question about it. And, and that was pretty much the same situation we were in, that it, it made a huge difference in keeping the doors open. And that's the, that's the type of thing that, you know, it's not just a news source and a community service. It's also a business that employs people and uh, circulates money in the community. Yeah, there's it, stuff, you know, talking about these complicated plans, trying to claw back money from Facebook because they were better at it than we were. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is, uh, really, um, is distasteful to me. Now, what there's, you know, they're talking about this news, this tax credit bill where they'd help support newspaper payrolls. That's, a, that'd be fantastic. I'd love that. But, you know, this idea, you know, that if they go claw back money from Google and Facebook, none of it's going to end up in Angelo's pocket. It's all going to end up in Alden Capital's pocket. Yes. That's the way government right. works. Right. That's right. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I think I'm unmuted. Right. Um, the, the other key thing, and this is brought up in our chat by Ken uh, Signa, Signa Lori, Loro, um, and that's Rule 230. This is back in, uh, I think, the 1996 Telecommunication Act when they made, uh, you know, publishers uh, or digital publishing uh, not liable for the comments that they make. Uh, you know, TV is, print is, radio is but the internet's not liable for anything they say. And they did that because it's a platform as opposed to a news station. And of course, we all know that that's not true today. Uh, and it ought to be you know, cut out of there and they ought to play under the same rules we do. And when they did that, what they'd have to do is hire about 100,000 editors across the country and it would affect their bottom line, but it would also make for better information out in the country. And that's what key, you know, we can compete with them if we're on the same playing field, but let's make it a, a same playing field. So I think that's a super, uh, really important point. Um, the, the other thing I would say is, is the government could do one more thing that I would hope that all of us in the news business would start pushing. And that is, we are a community resource and an asset, and that's been said several times here, in giving to newspapers, in the simple act of trying to support the, the community newspaper that you wanna support, we're not tax exempt. So if there is one line that said, community newspapers defined as blank, fill it in, can be a tax exempt organization so you can give to them if you choose, and, and it'll be tax exempt, that would make a huge difference. We wouldn't have to go around the horn like we're, we're creating all these sorts of ins and outs to try to make a simple gift tax exempt. And that's just crazy. We got a 10,000 page. 
10,000 page tax bill. I want three lines. And, and we had, we had solved part of our problem. Just Thanks, let Tim. people that want to support the paper support them. Thank you. Let's go to uh, Tim next, gentlemen. He had his hand up. Tim? I just wanted to chime in real quick on the subject of, of uh, internet platforms needing an editor. I happened to notice before we jumped on that Art's editorial uh, today is ex about exactly that topic. So uh, I recommend that read if anyone has a second. About Spotify. Yeah, they don't have enough <laughs> editors uh, keeping a leash on Joe Rogan. <laughs> we, ha we, we have a, uh, uh, an editorial that my predecessor wrote in the, I want to say, mid 80s about how the the newspaper's purest duty is to not run things that come into them it's to keep the junk out of out of the public's consumption and you know feed them the vegetables <laughs> well with with that in mind what from all of you on the panel and i, I want to hear a varying uh, variety of of definitions here what is your definition of ethics in reporting and why in today's world does it matter? Jump ball. Well, it seems that ethics is whatever will fit into your back pocket. <laughs> um, and whatever you can get away with. And uh, it's very discouraging to me. Um, and... Uh, you know, you can look. Ethics is a pretty broad field, but it it, it seems that uh, that uh, we aren't. If we could just get back to some standards of reporting uh, in the media, within the media, if we could get back to standards of reporting and operating in the public square, and uh, that would be huge progress. But we've abandoned a lot of basic uh, tenets of reporting. In our in our chatterbox here, right here, Lisa. Uh, yeah, standards of reporting. I agree nationally and even state on state levels. We see an awful lot of gotcha journalism. We see an awful lot of clickbait headlines, and I think it really comes back to the relationship you have in your community. I think journalistic ethics are are situational to a degree in that you are situated in your community and you have a responsibility to report about these people truthfully and honestly and fairly because they're your neighbors and we, we all live here. And I think that, that creates a slightly different standard for community newspapers in Vermont. We are not disconnected from our readers. We're not a digital platform away from our, they, we are, they are our neighbors. We see them at the hardware store and we see them at the coffee shop. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll jump in if you want. If I'm, um, you know, there's there's a saying that, um, or this, some, sometimes there's this belief that editors can get away with anything. You know, they can write anything they want to. They go wild and that sort of thing. You kind of look back at the person who says that and think, and you say, I've got twenty thousand critics right out my door. The second I make a mistake, I hear it from <laughs> so many people. So it's your community that keeps you honest, which is another reflection of why community journalism is slightly different, why it's so important, is because you don't get away with a lot, because people call you on it. People Just call you on it. Yes, they sure do. They call you and on everything, and you better make a correction, and it better be prominent, and, and because that's how you keep their trust. And um, people parse your words. People parse yeah. every word I write sometimes, and I've had people <laughs> call me or email me and say, I don't think you really meant provenance of something i think you meant providence i'm like all right well thank you i really appreciate you hanging on my every word i'm so appreciative if we could do one at a time here that would be perfect uh randy had a stand up and then tim well, i call it the supermarket rule that you when the people you write about you if you run into them in the supermarket and can still face them when you're going through the aisle and you're going to face them when you're going through the aisle, then you've done a good, uh, a good job. I mean, it's cut boils down to be accurate, be fair, don't be a jerk. Uh, Tim. Um, I just wanted to put in a word about how wonderful I think corrections are. They're one of my favorite things in newspapers. I, 
I've talked to reporters all over who are horrified when they have to make corrections. And I always thought, well, that's just, that's one of the, the best things we do about our job is when we make a mistake, we say, hey, stop what you're doing and pay attention to this right here. It says that we, we got this wrong. And sometimes I just learn things about a story that I never knew were possible when I have to do a correction. I remember someone, we had to write a story uh, over the summer, I think, about um, hardware disease in cows, um, cows who had eaten this, uh, this uh, uh, metal wire and how it was killing cows in this herd. And the, the farmers couldn't detect the wire because it was stainless steel and non-magnetic. And someone called me up and said, hey, you know, stainless steel is actually magnetic. And so I had to go down this whole rabbit hole of finding out the details of that. And it led to a correction and it was a great correction. And now that record is set straight. I love that news, the news industry in general values the truth over, over saving face. I think that's a wonderful thing we do. Where can someone who might not necessarily be a journalist go to uh, find out what kind of codes of ethics journalists live by? And do you all subscribe to organizations with those codes? I'll, I'll jump in quickly. There's, there's a society of uh, professional journalists and they have a code of ethics uh, right up front and center on their website. And uh, I think the first item there is seek the truth and report it fully. And that sort of is the, the encapsulation. Anybody else? Yeah, there's that Sigma Delta Chi. And, you know, I think most of us probably live by that, uh, even though if you don't memorize it, like the Ten Commandments. But, you know, you don't take, you don't let the mayor buy you lunch. And, uh, you know, it's not real complicated stuff, as we've discussed previously. And, and there is no code of ethics because, for one thing, we're not a profession. Uh, we are, this is a trade. It's not a profession. And so there is no code, there is no license. I think we all try to operate with, uh, you know, strict honesty and accuracy. And that's, uh, that's and as we described, that we got to live here too, routine, uh, governs our ethics. Definitely. I'm going to uh, briefly go to someone off the panel. Uh, there's a Jessica Lee Smith out there who's had her hand up. She has your question. If you could unmute and uh, on video, uh, go ahead. Yes. Hi. I don't know if you can hear me. My phone is not very good. Uh, we um, can. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. I want to say thank you guys so much for having this. And I want to say that that's why I respect the Commons newspaper so much. You may not have a guideline to follow, but you still follow one and you give the whole story. You're not owned by one political side or the other. That's incredibly unique, but it does make sense that they would give you less funding because you can't be bought. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, so somebody just came up with a uh, question on the chat room. Should newspapers be subsidized by the government in the same way some other industries are? Let's hear some thoughts about that. Like PBS, for instance. Lisa. Um, absolutely. The government has a vested interest in having informed citizens and newspapers perform what, that very critical function in a democracy of keeping citizens informed, creating a marketplace of ideas to talk about proposals and candidates. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Uh, Tim. Uh, I, I am leery of direct subsidy. I actually really, appreciated Art's suggestion earlier about, um, about A, public health insurance. Um, I think that that would, I mean, just as a, as a business owner, forget the newspaper part, as a business owner, not having to wade into that water um, would be so, so helpful. Um, stuff like that would be, would be huge, not just for us, but for everyone in our community. And I think when our community is strongest, we get stronger. Since we are all part of the community, do we have a role to play in strengthening the small businesses in our towns and cities 
since they frankly will end up being the ones that pay the freight if they can advertise. Bueller? Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Angelo. Yeah, I mean, we, let's, uh, we have a role to play. I think that role to play is to uh, highlight what's what's in our community and, and the value that those businesses contribute to the community or are not. Um, but I, I think that is the proper role for the newspaper to play in there. I'm not sure we should be championing anything. But, you know, the government did a great job uh, in, in the pandemic with the PPP and that helped all of us. It didn't just help newspapers, it, it helped all of us. I think the question is, should, should government subsidize, and you know, let's just put it out there, should they subsidize newspapers like they subsidize farmers? <laughs> you know, the, we need food, we need news, <laughs> but you know, the problem that we have from an ethical point of view is that we report on the same government that's, that's giving us that hand, hand up. And, and farmers don't report on it, so they don't have a, a conflict there. We have that inherent conflict, and therefore, that the ethics involved in this is is much different. And uh, we need to find other ways. Like like I said, the the best way is to make us. Uh, it, if the government could change the rule that that allowed us to accept donations, that would solve a huge problem because then we can. We can compete, and if they also level the playing field on on, on uh, digital platforms, um, but that's the type of thing I think we should do, not direct subsidies. Uh, I, I'm I'm with Tim on that. I'm a little wary of getting the hand out and then turning around and writing a story. It, it just feels wrong. Should be wrong. I'm sure it's not in any code of ethics I've ever <laughs> read. <laughs> so, and it will harm our credibility. Even if you're not taking the money, or let's say we aren't getting the subsidy and the Des Moines Register is, uh, people would paint us with the same brush and it just wouldn't be good for our credibility. We're already getting subsidized to a certain extent through legal notices and postage. And uh, we got to defend legal notices and defend the rate structure for legal notices. Those really are important to the public, it, not just to our bottom line, but to the public. And, and, you know, and we really, we ought to be enforcing that idea that we're supposed to get damn near free postal rates. And just think of what that would do for all of us. It would be a huge relief. Lisa. Oh, sorry, am I muted? I'm unmuted. No, you're not. You're well, unmuted. I think the fact that the government did hand out PPP and handed it out um, openly, and I believe at the same time we were reporting on it, we were receiving it. I think there is a line that we can straddle in terms of government subsidies. If the uh, Build Back Better, no, if the infrastructure bill, I forget which one has the uh, tax credits, it's Build Back Better, I believe. If that passes, we'll get a tax credit, a, a per salary, per reporter tax credit, which I don't feel will affect our credibility in the community because it's a business thing that our accountant is going to do that our community will know that this is happening because we are a newspaper and newspapers will be receiving this subsidy. But I think there's a way to do that ethically. I'd like to uh, get each of you to weigh in on the topic before we hear from, uh, from Penny, uh, weigh in on the topic of where do you see all this going? Will we survive and in what fashion? Go right down the line with our panelists. We'll start with Art. Could you repeat the question one more time? Sure, again, uh, operators are standing by, uh, old radio term. Uh, where do you see our future being? Will we survive and in what form will it be? Uh, yes, uh, community journalism it, it will survive, uh, and it's because the uh, Angelo is doing a tremendous job. I've seen his paper in in Middlebury, and we're doing a tremendous job. I'd like to thank in Storm Lake, Iowa, and there's always going to be a need for for information, uh, for credible information, 
Uh, our problem is how do we package it in a in a contemporary business model that we we none of us have quite figured out. I think we're all getting there. We're, we are figuring it out. And I, I, as we've stated repeatedly, I think the future obviously involves digital and print. And, uh, um, but it's just, we're not the advertising middleman anymore and we're not going to be. And uh, uh, I'm, I take a fairly dim view of the future of free shopping publications, shoppers. Uh, I think their days are numbered. And, uh, and I think it's all about readership at this point and serving, serving, uh, serving the readers without fear or favor. And, and uh, the, the lack of advertising is that also somewhat liberating. Okay, uh, let's go right down the line, uh, Randy. So long as our readers see us as a relevant part of their lives and that we're delivering a service to them that they, that they value and support, there'll be community journalism. And people love reading about themselves. They always have and they always will. And uh, there's a term known as refrigerator journalism of you know stuff that gets clipped out of the paper and stuck on the refrigerator. You can't really do that with a website, although you can print it out. Uh, there's still people like seeing their names in the paper. And so long as people still feel that way, they'll still be reading us in whatever medium they're going to be reading us. Thank you, Randy. Lisa. Yes, I think we'll survive. I think there is a future for us. I think there's a strong desire for local knowledge, especially as Angela has pointed out, the more we're digitally distracted, the less connected we are. And the more we can connect with our communities by telling the stories of the people who live there and talking about our select boards and our school boards, I think there's an appetite for that. I think people are starting to turn a little bit away from digital connections and towards human connections. And that's what community newspapers do. And I also think Art is right. We have to come up with slightly different revenue models and different packaging models. I read today in my early morning scrolling of my iPhone that the New York Times hit its digital subscription goal six months early, I believe. And while none of us have the resources of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal to capitalize ourselves and subsidize ourselves for the years it takes so you can make the shift from a reader subscription model away from a, an advertising model, we all have to start working that way because Art's also right. We used to be the middleman and we've lost that ability to be the middleman because everybody's on Instagram putting what their menu is for this week. You know, so we have to find a different model. But yes, I think the desire for accurate local information and connection will prevail. And it won't be Front Porch Forum or some other community forum, bulletin board. Thank you. Angelo. Yeah, I think Lisa makes a good point that um, you know, the, the other models out there are community journalism or, you know, citizen journalism where that's the, the free form model where everybody just goes out and reports and sends their notes in or they hear about this or they hear about that. And what's missing there is that editor and, and that reporter who has been there at that meeting time after time after time understands the context and can put those stories and those meetings into a year long or two year or 20 year context. And that's what's missing with citizen journalism. That's why it breaks down and why you get so much bad information out in the community. Um, so yes, community journalism that's done by uh, experienced reporters that have a clue about what they're watching and how to report that to the community with good editors to keep things uh, in context and straight. Uh, th this is, that's our bread and butter and that's what we, uh, that's what we do well. And I think there will always be a need for that. We're going to move, uh, hopefully not away from print. You know, I'm, I'm a huge print fan, but we also do a lot on digital. We all need to do a lot on digital. But the warning there is that we have not made digital, uh, even the best of us still don't make digital uh, advertising work. You make digital subscriptions work, but not digital advertising. And uh, so we're still money short. We have to figure out a different model. I think some of that's going to be philanthropy and how much we can ask our readers to contribute uh, and maybe other foundations and that sort of thing, because it is important that uh, we stay 
uh, able to do that job. And I, I prefer that we do it with more money so that we do the job the best to our ability. Thanks. Thank you, Tim, and then Melanie. Yeah, so I'm I'm generally optimistic. I think that that I I want to be honest and and say that I I think like most people who own small newspapers, I vacillate back and forth a lot. You know, some days I think, oh, we're all going down the tubes, and other days I think, oh, thank God we have a we have what we have, and it's and things are looking good. Um, honestly, as as long as we still keep seeing young people who who show an interest in being parts of their community then uh, I think we have a bright future. And I think that future involves uh, both print and digital for the foreseeable future, at least. Thank you, Tim. Melanie? Okay, there we go. Um, I'm not sure how much I can add to what everybody else has already said, but I, I am optimistic about the future. I do believe that people want their local news. They want to know what's going on. They want to know the, how the local sports teams are doing. Um, we do need to address the, the revenue issues and, and so forth. Um, I think there's, there's a couple things that, that we can do better to help um, ensure our survival. Number one, every, everybody here has emphasized community journalism. And I think what we need to do is do a better job of separating ourselves fr from, from the megaphones of, of the, the me media corporations, mostly broadcast and the the one-sided uh, animosity that's being created with some of these some of these shows. We need to separate ourselves and and you know make sure people understand that we are your local paper, your your local news, and and we care. We live here. We care. We're not this this you know anonymous or, or invisible reporter that nobody sees and and doesn't answer to anybody or anything like that. We need to do a better job of marketing ourselves and, and showing the community that, that we are important and you do need us. That's it. Thank you. We're gonna bring in Penny at this point. She has had the chance to study the scene in Vermont and around the country. She's had the chance to listen to us pontificate for the last hour or so. What do you think? Where are we going? Where are we? Well, first off, let me say, uh, you know, it, it, I, I've listened in with special interest uh, because I read Vermont journalism every day. I've had a home in Vermont for more than 20 years. So uh, I've looked on the scene. I've looked on the uh, transformation. And as I said uh, earlier uh, yesterday in an email, I start every day by reading the Bennington Banner. And it is so wonderful to see the... Um, the flourishing of local journalism here in Vermont. So, you know, there are a number of ways that Vermont is very similar to what's going on in the country. And there are a number of ways that Vermont stands out for actually not being, uh, uh, or at least having advantages that other states don't. Uh, the first one I would say is what's been interesting tonight is to listen to the number of independent publishers. And uh, to me, if we're looking at reviving trust, reviving support for local news, being locally owned is vitally important. Uh, it, it is that notion of knowing who the editor is, knowing who the publisher is, knowing who you can call to, to compliment and complain. Uh, the person you run into the grocery store to give the, the, the story and the tip to. Uh, I, the other thing I like is what I've heard through all of this is what really motivated me and what I've become uh, much more passionate about as a uh, over the last seven or eight years when I've been documenting the, uh, the state of local news uh, is that uh, we've talked about not just how important and what is at stake for our democracy if we lose a newspaper or we lose a community newspaper, but what is at stake for society? Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm also feeling very fortunate about is the number of young researchers who've kind of taken up uh, uh, the baton from other researchers in the past and have begun to document exactly what is at stake for our democracy. So let me uh, tip off, just run through what we found in just the last couple of years of what happens when you lose a newspaper. One, and so, and this is what is at stake for democracy. One, voter participation goes way down. There's a new book out that shows that the decline in local news correlates even more uh, significantly with the decline in voter participation, especially in local elections. 
you know, you can start with a whole range of things, but first off, you don't even know who's running. So there's an uh, inherent advantage to incumbents uh, when you don't know who's running uh, there uh, and when voter participation goes down. Secondly, corruption goes up and that corruption goes up at both the government, local government and it also in local businesses. Uh, if nobody's watching. So it's not necessarily a watchdog function, but it's a transparency function. And then finally, you and I as ordinary citizens suffer because taxes go up, because financial institutions are loath to loan to places that um, do not uh, have kind of a transparency or somebody showing up at the local school board meeting. Uh, so that's what's at stake for democracy. What's at stake for our society is that local uh, newspapers are really the glue. They, they tell us what the soul of a community is. They connect us with people, our next door neighbors. They connect us with people that we thought we knew, but we don't know, or people we'd like to know that we don't know. And they help build a really strong sense of community. There's been a lot of study out of various um, uh, land grant universities about what makes a community and what is a sense of community. And what they've identified are a kind of intangible capitals. And that's what a newspaper brings us. They tell us what the culture of a place is. They tell us what uh, people are doing. Uh, they kind of pull us together in a way to help us solve problems. Uh, realizing that somebody shares the same problem we have, realizing that somebody sh shares the same potential that we have. So, you know, for me, if you ask me, do I say, uh, do I feel good? You know, I've, I've, I've said I've joked on a lot of occasions because the research has shown that over the last 15 years, we've lost a fourth of all newspapers. And I was really interested to hear tonight about what PPP meant for uh, uh, folks on the, on the ground here, because what I have sensed is because of PPP, we didn't lose as many papers last year as we have been losing on average over the past uh, 15 years. We've been losing between 100 and 150 papers, community papers, mostly community papers over the last uh, each year. So, and my sense is we didn't lose, we, we were on the low side on 100. So, I mean, there is a notion that we need to, as a society kind of acknowledge that some kind of support is gonna be needed to get us through this transition period. Uh, and that we're going to have to be very innovative. The other thing I think that's interesting is having worked on this in for the last 15 years, I'm also uh, encouraged that I see a lot of innovative business uh, models that are being done. And most often the, mo the best innovation comes from the independents. So I think there are three things that determine whether you uh, have uh, the ability to create a strong business model, a new one, an innovative one that's going to help you uh, continue to provide that news. One is the demographics of a community. And Vermont is kind of uh, lucky in that it's, you know, economic uh, uh, profile in most places is relatively similar to what the economic profile is in the U.S. as a whole. So you're not in an economically struggling area. It has more independence than many states have. So you've got the ability of an owner who's there and knows the community and knows how to respond to those unique uh, needs. And, uh, and then, but I think the real key is going to be capital. And for me, you know, it's going to be, is it going to be a for-profit model? Is it going to be a non-profit model? Is it going to be a combination of that for, for newspapers? Or is it going to be public uh, funding? that kind of eases, especially areas that can't develop a for-profit or non-profit model in, in the foreseeable future, is that going to be the key to sustaining good local news? Um, you know, I, I would throw one more thing in terms of indirect government support that we ought to be looking at, and that is digital access. And I was glad to hear all of you say that you see print as an, an integral part going forward because we lose sight because we li listen to what the industry says when we say, you know, we have broadband availability uh, broad almost everywhere. But in fact, it's very difficult to uh, hook up in most places. I would say 50 percent of the U.S. still does not have a high speed Internet. Uh, I'm speaking to you to, to the, to tonight from a farm in North Carolina where I have a Rube Goldberg kind of contraption 
that relies on radio waves bounced off a series of cell towers onto an antenna on the tallest pine tree on my property. No one would call that high-speed internet who can actually be hooked up into broadband. And that is a really serious thing as we think ahead of what digital looks like for us and what we need to think about for our readers is how connected are our readers. We need to think not only about the content we're producing, but also the uh, how we are distributing it and how we get it across that last uh, mile going forward. So, I mean, for me, I think it is one of those things where you have to be optimistic about the future. I started documenting this because I wanted to make sure that uh, we knew what areas were most at risk. Uh, Vermont is a wonderful state where people still show up for town meetings, <laughs> where people still care about those issues, where they still talk about them civilly and they, they follow rules and they do a lot of other things. And so, you know, and they also support newspapers. I mean, uh, so, I mean, it is a, it's a well-educated state in which people have a long history of valuing that. So I think in Vermont, we're in a, in a unique situation of trying to kind of mobilize and get everyone around the whole notion that news literacy is not just news literacy, it's civics literacy. And, uh, and that if we, the more we combine all that in together, the more we can, as a, as a citizenry and as, a re, as residents in a community, come to appreciate what a local newspaper means and what we need to do to support that, whether it's through subscriptions, whether that's through donations, whether that is through the business person um, uh, in the community buying the advertising, whether it is the policymakers at the state level, which uh, ensure that legals are run in, legal advertising still is available to run in newspapers from all of that, because all of that's gonna be really, really important uh, to determining what the, the kind of future we, uh, and how we deliver news in one way or another. Thank you for all of that. And I would tell you that as a 25 year town moderator, I'd love you to show up at my town meeting. That would be a, a great thing. Great. I wanna thank our panelists tonight. I wanna thank the people who were watching and participating with their questions and certainly continue to support your local paper by all means. Question them vigorously, but show them your support. On behalf of Vermont Independent Media, the Commons and Next Stage Arts, we thank all of our panelists and everyone who joined the conversation. Local media really does need your help. And those who joined in the conversation, and I know that all of our local papers appreciate donations. You can actually donate online or in the mail, contact the various publications that you've seen here tonight and make that choice. Every little bit helps. The easiest way to donate is online. Each newspaper has a donation button. Thank you all again for watching. Have a good night and good news.